Welcome back to the next part of The Curious Show. Today our topic is sequencing technology and genomics. Let's take another look at Sanjana's microbiome project. She will show us how easy her NGS library prep workflow is. Before you start your library prep, you must select your library prep method based on factors such as experimental goals and type of applications or type of analytes. For example, the choice of method depends on whether you're planning on performing whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing. You also need to consider the amount and quality of your sample. In our case, we're using the KaiSeq FX kit. Now, let's start the library preparation. The KaiSeq library prep workflow is simple. First, we fragment the DNA. DNA fragmentation is random and reproducible, and the fragment size can be customized based on application and read length for sequencing. The reaction time affects the fragment size, with longer reactions resulting in smaller fragments. Once the sample is fragmented, repaired and atailed, part two begins, adapter ligation. Adapters allow samples to bind to a sequencing chip and contain barcodes for multiplexing multiple samples at once. As the adapters are dual barcoded, for example, 96 samples could be run in parallel. This reduces cost and controls data generation. The NGS library is ready for sequencing in just two and a half hours. With sustainability in mind, it's important to reduce the amount of plastic consumables whenever possible. The simple KaiaSeq library prep workflow can easily be automated on a variety of liquid handlers to meet high throughput library prep needs. Now the NGS library is ready for sequencing. Therefore, I need a little help from another instrument. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah thanks again uh, to Sanja for this great insight she has provided to us again. Um, now let's review our first results of the, f or the results of the first poll. And this seems, ah, oh. here they are. So the, the poll was, what are your biggest challenges in next generation sequencing? And obviously low DNA yield is one of the biggest challenges uh, people have. And of course, yeah, we know the data analysis, it's, it's a big hurdle with all the terabyte of, of information or terabyte of uh, you know, sequencing results are produced and how to interpret those results. And of course, yeah, also library prep, uh, yeah, things and all those will be partly already yeah. have addressed in your talk Great. with Dylan. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm glad to see that Dylan and I had the chance to address the biggest concern, which is low DNA yield. Um, yeah. So yeah, if there are additional questions, please feel free to reach out to our uh, technical support. And um, this is something that I feel Kaijin, our team has a lot of expertise in. So um, great. Yeah. So, okay, then let's uh, switch in gears now and coming back actually to the uh, main topic of our show today, which is about the future and vision of NGS. And uh, show me briefly want to highlight a couple of those, you know, big topics uh, everybody more or less in the research world and clinical world is discussing. And uh, one of them, of course, the increased throughput and speed, you know, with all the multiplexing grades, you know, what we have today and what you actually really can load on one flow. So today it's already pretty amazing. Another thing is the produced uh, uh, or the reduced costs. You know, I mentioned before human genome, billions of dollars. Today you have a human genome, a whole human genome, actually for two hundred dollars, and there are companies, new vendors out there claiming maybe hundred dollars even in the, in the near future. Another one is, and of course, what I also briefly mentioned, it's not only research. Also, you know, we have a lot of applications going, you know, already into clinical applications. Absolutely. So um, we briefly touched upon our understanding of the human genome and biology exponentially increased, enabled by sequencing technology and decreased cost. So I think that will absolutely help us, help us understand precision medicine and perhaps we can benefit from precision medicine in the near future, uh, which is absolutely great news, right? And um, advancement in data analysis, integration of artificial intelligence um, based on the vast, no, vast amount of knowledge that has been created in the past decade. Um, single cell by, a single cell analysis <coughs> enabled by sequencing capabilities, spatial analysis by the 
crazy amount of sequencing we can do now um, and advanced sequencing analysis. Um, I think it's yeah. just amazing to be thinking about. Maybe a couple other things. It's not only to know the DNA sequence, of course, there's also those epigenomics, you know, the methylation pattern people are looking uh, at today. And Shu, you know, you already mentioned it's the third generation of sequencing, actually long read, where we know particular pseudogenes or complex uh, genomic variants, whereas in long read obviously has a big advantage to small or short read sequencing. And last but not least, what I would like to mention is this big topic about omics. And it's not only, you know, to have DNA and RNA together, so genomic and transcriptomic, but you're also do, discussing now to have proteomics together or metagenomics, so everything actually together one, from one sample. Yes, absolutely. Very exciting times. Um, with everything you can sequence together, th different things that you can integrate. Um, very exciting times. Yeah, but it's not only you and me discussing about it. I think you also had a chance to talk to one of the new vendors outside there. Maybe you share a little bit about this. Absolutely. Um, so I had the privilege of speaking to Sean Levy, um, who's the chief technology officer from Element Biosciences, um, who's a fairly new uh, sequencing platform provider. So um, shall we take a look at the video? Of course. Welcome, Sean. Um, we're very honored to have you as a guest to our Curious Show. First, can you tell us how has NGS technology transformed basic and translational research in the past decade? I think NGS is really exists in the same realm as, say, PCR, as far as transformative technologies. You know, how, how it's changed not only our ability to look at biology, but also our ability to look at the types of assays and, and the scale of assays we've done has been you know, truly revolutionary to, uh, to, the, to the biotechnology space. Um, uh, across the board. Can you share a specific area of interest that you have a strong passion for um, and have seen great advancement through NGS technology? One of the more rewarding um, and really useful parts of that was the, the huge diversity of projects that, uh, that myself and my, my group and, and the colleagues at Hudson Alpha worked on. You're truly extending across these, these you know, very broad areas of biology, everything from forensics you know, of applying some of the techniques that were developed uh, primarily for oncology work, working with very challenging oncology samples, but extending them to these super degraded forensic samples um, and being able to play a role in, in solving some, some cold cases and, uh, and, and helping families achieve closure or, or bring justice uh, as appropriate. It's always been very rewarding when, when you see those results or you see that study really make a difference. Bringing forward new advancements and the understanding of complex disorders like cancer or diabetes or, or neurological conditions. Can you tell us a bit of what do you envision um, that's the future of NGS? Certainly data integration, um, you know, data access in terms of data sharing and, and, and things like best practices so that we have true data comparability. I think we do spend a lot of time today looking at, say, technology comparisons, you know, what technology is better than another under, under certain conditions. And that's important to a point, but at some point, you know, we also have to recognize that, that really focusing on how data can be integrated uh, and shared and access to really leverage um, all the investments that are going in and, and the value of the samples, particularly human samples that are, that are being analyzed, to make sure we maximize that value. So that when we do use those precious samples in an experiment, that experiment is both efficient as well as accurate. Um, recently, we announced a partnership between Kyogen and Element. Um, can you say a few words about our partnership? Sure. Yeah, I think you know, Element's thrilled to have this partnership with Kyogen. Um, it's, it's a fairly broad uh, partnership. Um, you know, we're, we're recognizing certainly the long history and excellence that, that Kyogen has in many of the product areas and fields that are related to what Element's, uh, where Element has goals, as well as you know, adjacent to those goals so that we know that um, whether it be from sample preparation, you know, certainly sequencing technologies are, are only as good as the input sample, um, all the way through to you know, library preparation and even data analysis. You know, Kyogen has very broad products in all of those areas, and so we're thrilled to partner with Kyogen to together help advance our capabilities in, in both sequencing and then even beyond sequencing. Fantastic. We're very much looking forward to working with Element Biosciences and um, helping with our customers with their many, many different sequencing projects. Yeah, us, us too. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Great, thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much again to Sean Levy, the Chief Technology Officer of Element Biosciences. Um, and I would really like you know, to highlight one of the topics what he mentioned, you know, with the pressured sample, so to get most of one sample. And I think that's what we already also discussed with the different challenges, also what we have seen in the first poll. But okay, so now let's go to our second poll. We want to hear from you what type of sequencing to perform. While we wait to hear from our um, audience members, um, I would like to introduce to you um, our one of, to hear from one of our customers, yeah. Dr. Bry Wilson. Um, he has a very interesting sequencing project that he has been doing, and let's take a listen. I was brought up on Cousteau's voyages by my father when I was much younger, who was a diver himself, and he'd kind of. Uh, told me these incredible stories of, of diving at reefs around the world. I work in the Chagos Archipelago Marine Protected Area. This is an extraordinarily remote coral reef. In fact, one of the most remote coral reef systems in the world. And one of the reasons this is so interesting is because it's a system where we can study the effects of climate change without the confounding factors of human impacts. Corals are wonderful ancient denizens of the sea. They have representatives from essentially every single kingdom kind of nestled within a, a single kind of coral colony and you've got the, the microbes, the viruses, the bacteria, the archaea, fungi, protists, you have the fish and the shrimp and each one of these brings its own little microbial party to the coral and share these, uh, these, these various organisms. So it's an extraordinarily uh, difficult system to work with. By using molecular tools, we can actually examine the DNA of these uh, particular organisms and actually tease apart these kind of very complex community and extraction kits that we work with. Molecular techniques are particularly important when it comes to looking at the factors that affect corals. Uh, things like climate change factors, things like direct human impacts. If we see certain genes that are related to stress or a, a confounding of the immune system or even a proliferation of a particular pathogen which is going to cause a problem, then these are things that we can essentially see well in advance of symptoms of coral stress. And that means we might actually be able to manage and mitigate these factors given time. One of the big issues we have with extracting DNA from environmental samples is the downstream processing. It's the inhibitors, the contaminants that are part of nature and the chaos of these samples that, that affect the things that we do downstream. I've been using collagen gits now for, for a decade or more and, and they have been the market leaders in a lot of the DNA extraction kits that we work with. And so one of the things that Kyogen have done a very good job of doing is, is using reagents that actually sequester these things that prevent us from amplifying DNA. The particular sample that I sent to Kyogen for sequencing was a, was a tricky one to get. Because there aren't many humans diving or even swimming in this part of the world, the sharks are very cure out. They're not really uh, posing a problem or a danger, but they do distract you from the issue at hand, which in my case was sampling the Tonella chagius, the world's rarest coral. I returned to my labs at the University of Oxford and then shipped these out to the Kyogen headquarters in Germany where they extracted the DNA from this particular sample. These coral samples actually were the first ones that Kyogen had ever processed. In a system this complex, you're never pulling out just the genome of a single organism. It's a huge jigsaw puzzle that has to be uh, solved when you're doing uh, genomic assemblies. There's a whole raft of questions that I'm going to use this genomic information to answer. Whether, as I've said, there are potential pathogenic species that may, given certain environmental changes, uh, proliferate and cause disease within these corals. These are all things that I'm very much hoping the genome is going to be revealed. I had this unique opportunity to be the first person on this planet to actually delve into the recipe of life for the world's rarest coral. And it was something that, as a scientist, you dream of an opportunity to be a trailblazer, to do something that nobody else has done. Yeah, then again, thank you very much, Brian, for Brian Wilson, for this great update. And maybe to share a little personal uh, experience I did, because when I was in my young 
20s, uh, also did a diving last actually in New Zealand and also had a chance to dive at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And I really, if I see what, what Brian is actually doing, it's really amazing because the world you see in there, in that, uh, in that ocean, it's really, yeah, it's just amazing. It's every biologist's dream. That's <laughs> fantastic. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that story as well. Um, shall we take a look? Um, from our audience member of the second yeah. poll, uh, what is what type of sequencing do you perform? Wow, look at that! Um, I think whole transcriptome sequencing is winning at thirty-two percent. And the next one is green targeted DNA sequencing. Actually, it's a tie targeted DNA sequencing. In orange, whole genome, whole exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, yeah. So it's a lot about the genome, then also with whole genome, exome, and then with targeted uh, DNA. And interesting that actually methylation is only 3%, because also there, uh, there are very promising uh, publications, uh, yeah. what we all can reveal, as we mentioned, you know, of, about epigenomics. Great. Well, great. Yeah. Well, we look forward to reading more uh, what you are doing uh, from, our target, uh, from our audience members. That's great. Uh, well, next, uh, we would love to share more, uh, another story from our customers. Uh, it's from uh, Hummingbird Diagnostics, um, a company based in Germany. And um, it's about how they did, uh, from, our, from their small RNA sequencing project, um, how they found that small RNA may serve as a tool uh, that may improve cancer patients' outcome with, with treatment. Very Let's take a look. We focus on whole blood because um, it's the most common method or most common source for a liquid biopsy. The small RNAs can be used to detect, for example, a disease or a condition in human being by just measuring the expression of those small RNAs in a biological specimen. While being a great pre analytical tool, the PEXGEN samples all the RNA material that you have in the whole blood. So your signal from a tumor may be completely lost in the plethora of other RNAs which comes from, uh, for example, uh, red blood cells. And we have faced this problem because uh, there is only three microRNAs with such a high expression that they can completely um, overshadow the signal that would be coming from a tumor. So we teamed up with NGS team from Biogen and we co-developed together a fast select reagent customized to our purposes. This fast select is essentially a set of oligonucleotides that block um, target molecules, in our case these very abundant three microRNAs. In this way we can save a lot of bandwidth on an NGS for the really interesting material. It is very important that you have, uh, that you increase your depth of discovery as much as you can. The tumor, especially at the very early stage, almost does not shed any material that can be sampled for in the whole blood. And therefore, it was instrumental for us that we can go as deep as possible. When we have developed our early cancer detection signature based on small RNAs, we had to start with a large amount of samples. These clinical samples were harvested in different clinics across Europe as well as USA and essentially contained two groups a control group with individuals which had already previous history of smoking but did not have any diagnosed tumor, and a second group of newly diagnosed uh, persons with um, lung tumor. After we have extracted RNA and blocked the unwanted species, we have analyzed the NGS profile of the small RNAs of these two groups. Then we have compared these two groups and tried to find a signature which would predict on the new patient in a validation cohort whether this patient is likely a cancer patient or is a control. So the thorough analysis of the data sets using the AI and machine learning allowed us to identify a handful of small RNAs which can predict with a very high accuracy lung cancer. So the fast select and the later additions to these reagents has helped us to uncover molecules which were stemming from the tumor at already very early stage. So the pipeline we have developed uh, which we use for, in our case, lung cancer detection, can be also applied to any other cancer, provided that the cancer is at a stage that it already sheds some material to the bloodstream.
What a great story um, from our customer at Hummingbird Diagnostics. It truly showcased the discovery power of next generation sequencing and how it's making its way into clinical applications. So with that, I would like to introduce one of my colleagues, Marina. Uh, we'd love to have a short chat about um, the development of the technology moving into clinical applications. So Marina, welcome. Thank you, Shu. It's great to be here. It's such a nice uh, settings and it was very nice to watch the show as great. well and to be a part of that as well. So my name is Marina Wicklander and I'm a regional marketing manager for clinical genomics here at Kaijen. Yeah, also a warm welcome from my side, Marina, that you are you. participating in the show here. So as you focus obviously on the MDX customer class in, in Kaij and, and those customers using various technologies, and what are the trends you have seen in the past years considering those NGS technologies? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very good question. So we see that our customers use a very wide range of molecular diagnostic tools, right? So they're using PCR, quantity PCR, digital PCR is currently also on the market. We have uh, microarrays and a fish assay as well. However, what we can see also, there is a very big trend in adopting NGS because the method became more reliable, more easy to use as well. And uh, we see that it's, it's been used now in uh, clinical, uh, clinical, routine clinical research as well. So it's, it's very interesting to watch the development, I would say. Yeah, I agree. That's great to hear. Um, can you comment on what kind of applications what, excuse me, what application areas are you seeing customers focusing on? Yeah, the, the application area is very, very wide. I mean, of course, the first thing I would, I would like to mention is oncology, right? So, and we can talk a little bit more later, uh, but uh, it's not only oncology. There is a lot of trends in using it in rare diseases, as you know, it's a more complicated area, and NGS is really helping there. Also, you probably heard there is a number of projects when it comes to newborn sequencing. And uh, you heard the UK started and now many countries adopted that as well. We see for carrier sequencing as well. And, uh, and of course, I shouldn't forget about the infectious diseases. I think the whole world learn about NGS. And I have to say, <laughs> even my parents, my family learn about NGS thanks to COVID pandemic. Thanks yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's not really good to say, but I hope we don't have to talk to, about COVID anymore, right? So. I hope so. But the world got a crash course. In exactly, NGS exactly. So at least now when <coughs> someone asking me, like, what are you working with, what, what the Kaijin is working with, and when you say NGS, everyone's like, oh, I actually know what it is. So yes. it's a nice thing. That's to, good. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we can come back to oncology. I yes. think a lot of people have heard of sequencing also from oncology. Absolutely. So if you, if you think about oncology, you know, cancer is a very complex disease, right? So a lot of uh, scientists and also clinicians realize that there is no one size fits all. So, and due to that reason, you know, you can have a patient which might have the same type of disease, but mm. probably different type of mutation. So they would respond differently to the yeah. treatment. And we see that there is a lot of trends moving towards precision diagnostics. And for that, you need to analyze, identify, and understand more the mutation and the genomic background in general. So if we look back 10 years at the NGS, Right. We, we saw very small panels, usually it was single biomarker testing mm -hmm. and technology of course was way more expensive due to that reason. Now we see that we have more studies done, more cohorts done, more analysis of variants as well and the panels growing as well and due to that reason also the chemistry is improving as well and the price is going down. I think mm -hmm. it was mentioned during the show as well. So we see more adaptation of NGS and more use of NGS in developing a precision diagnostic, companion diagnostic together in collaboration with the, with the pharma companies. Mm -hmm. And it's very important as we discussed about the comprehensive genomic profiling when both DNA and RNA biomarkers, bigger panels used. You, Peter, mentioned also the methylation profiling, which also used in oncological diagnostic studies as well whole genome amplification, whole exome sequencing as well, multi-omics. So there is 
a lot of trends we can see when it comes to NGS. But I think what I saw also from one of your polls, the biggest problem is, uh, it's of course the data analysis, mm -hmm. right? And we can see with all the new bioinformatic tools, algorithm, algorithm as well, we see that it's really enhanced use of NGS in uh, clinical diagnostic studies, clinical mm -hmm. uh, understanding and yeah. interpretation yeah. of the data, which is the key. That's key, yeah, absolutely. And the, the decreased costs also can enable larger population studies. Absolutely. For variant interpretation. Yeah. So there is a lot of factors which are coming in and we can see more adaptation for NGS, which is absolutely great, I think. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Marina, for sharing your insight. So with that, I bet you are still very curious to finding out more about NGS technology. We invite you to stay tuned for our next part of The Curious Show. We will discuss further about the clinical application of NGS technology. Kyogen. Sample to Insight.